Hi, I'm Pervez Shalwani of Newsday, and this is Feed Me, the scoop on the Long Island dining scene. Today, we hit the waters on the North Fork to watch fish go from catch to plate, head to Melville for Indian Chinese food. From there, we ask Long Islanders how to say gyro, that's how we say it in Chicago, and finish in Huntington for a lesson in barbecue at Oldfield. Time to go fishing with our new friend Artie on the Long Island Sound. Fishing is serious business on Long Island's East End. Hours, and in some cases days before fish makes it to your dinner plate, guys like Artie wake up before dawn in search of fluke, sea bass, black bass, and porgy. Among the rewards, the beauty of the morning sun as it rises over the water. Tell me about what, what goes on in a tow. Nothing. You see me sit in a chair and get a Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, you guys have thrown out how many feet of net, you said? Well, the sweep's 57 around like this. And the fish just swim into the net? Yeah, just like that. I don't know why, but they do. More than 45 years in the business, and Artie is still outsmarting his catch. My parents first let me go out when I was like 14 years old. And so when you were 14, who'd you go out with? Your friend. And it was just like casual fishing, or was it like commercial fishing back then at 14? I used to sell, I had a refrigerator in the garage. I'd bring the lobsters in. I'd pull the pots by hand, bring the lobsters in. The neighbors would come to the house and buy the lobsters. After dragging the net for a few miles in the middle of the Long Island Sound, Artie and his crew pull in their haul and prepare to sort what they will bring to the market this morning. Well, I want the jumbo sea bass, the jumbo scum. Okay. A few large fluke. Hey, Robert, there's a striped bass under there. The fish are measured and weighed to ensure they meet state requirements. Those that fall short are tossed back into the sea. Most of the day's catch will head to the city, but some of the best of what he catches that day will be set aside for local guys like Charlie at South Pole Fish Market. Charlie has developed a rapport over the years with local fish guys. Being the owner of one of the best places to eat and buy fish on the island, Charlie is known to hold fishermen to the highest of standards, but also to pay top dollar in return. Artie's actually one pushing for a lot of regulations and stuff like that, for New York to have better regulations. So that's the stuff he brought in for you today? Mm hmm You know, we'll get, you know, like the striped bass, the guys will bleed them, where it takes the blood out of them. I think actually he bled those too because it was blood He did, I saw them doing them, yeah. So, um, you know, so they, I mean, that, those stupid little tricks of doing that makes that fish that much better. Right. You know, so it looks nicer in the case, it holds up nicer, it eats, you know, getting the blood out of the fish, it makes it eat better. And so it's just like one of those It things. makes it what better? It, it, it eats a lot better. It doesn't right. have, the blood, the blood inside a fish actually sure. makes it fishy. Right. So if there's no blood in it, that's why like the guys that eat sushi and stuff, they want all their stuff bled. They, they want all the blood out of it. For the simple fact that that's what makes it strong. Right. So. Han Solo and Carbonite. Han Solo and Carbonite and Boba Fett. Yes, every day I ask them, what are your socks? You wear a chef's coat Don't ask me about my socks. Something fun. You taking my fish? The thing I love about uh, the guys that Charlie works with is that they're mostly from the traps. And uh, if you're going to serve fish raw, trauma doesn't translate to serving raw fish. And traps are the least amount of trauma. And frankly, I think that the future relies on really small guys handling these things like the really precious resource that it is. Now, is there enough trappers out there out, out, out on the East End? or? Yeah, there's plenty. So how many fish sometimes you end up touching before... Uh... I touch them all. I'm, I'm a weirdo with the fish. I'm obsessed, I'm obsessed. And that's the thing about Charlie is that he really lets... So does Charlie just look the other way while you're doing this? He does, and then he makes fun of me as much as he can. Um, but he, he allows this, and that's why we have such a good relationship. He knows what a freak I am. He knows how obsessed I am. And I know that he's, he also feels that same freakish obsession with freshness, with having the best product. Um, you know, he's got the best toys. Who doesn't want to play with Charlie? Adam traffics in toys of the earth. Trained under some of the city's best chefs, Adam and his wife Elizabeth have settled on the North Fork, where they run 18 Bay, a true farm-to-table restaurant on Shelter Island. Each morning, the two feverishly dash through the area's fertile lands and waters to gather the best ingredients that week, visiting Charlie and the farmers who raise everything from their vegetables and fruits to the eggs for their pasta. Is that us too? Yes. Awesome. So what a nice way to bring in the weekend, huh? Not terrible. Great. We'll text you tomorrow. Yes. Or, okay. or tonight. What more? Their product is like, it's unbelievable. I mean, these are their snow peas. 
jalapeno. Ramp flowers. I'm gonna taste one. Who's cultivating ramps? Much less do you get ramp, ramp flowers, flowers right? right? There are, um, focus on detail is overwhelming. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's the playground for us. We're in the sandbox with these guys. By lunchtime, the two have boarded a ferry bound for Shelter Island, where the rush will be on to make pasta, clean fish, and prepare for the night's three-course tasting menu. The striped bass will be turned into a crudo, the sea bass into crispy filet. The zucchini flowers will be stuffed with cheese, battered and delicately fried. So when you get to Charlie's Fish Market and you see these guys lined up and they've got those aquamarine blue faces, you know, you, that's what that's what you're waiting for. Right. You know, I mean, this is this is what gets us out of bed in the morning. We know these guys are waiting there for us, and like I said, I don't I don't want anyone else to get them. What does your wife say when she when you say things like I you know, gets me out of bed in the morning is the fish? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, she she knows who she married. You know, I mean, she's she's getting out of bed for pasta, and I'm getting out of bed for fish. fish so right. you know. That's why we're here doing this restaurant. Elizabeth and I moved out east to be closer to uh, the producers. When we were in Bayville, we would take our day off and we would drive out here and we would fill up the Hyundai like we still do. Um, and we would, you know, go back and, and, and the trips got longer and longer so we could spend more and more time. And we ultimately realized that this is where we wanted to be. No, Charlie was joking. He can he can cut these a lot faster than you can. If Charlie watched me cut fish, he would have an anxiety attack. I, you know, it's a little unfair because I have thousands and thousands of dollars in Japanese knives that I'm committed religiously to honing, sharpening, polishing, and careful. Yeah. Oh, I know. And so. Charlie somehow takes these white plastic handled knives and he cuts cleaner and faster than I do while laughing at me. And I don't think about it a lot, you know? But it's, it's the cold hard truth. Cutting and preparing great fish is arguably one of the hardest culinary art forms. It's a stress that it won't be done right. Right. It's a stress that this product will not be taken to its best of its ability, which if you just gently coax it in that direction, it will do all on its own. You know, a fisherman like Artie, he knows what he's doing. He knows what we're looking for in the sense of quality. He's not gonna compromise his product. He takes immaculate care of his fish. And if I can continue to take immaculate care of them, then you're gonna get an immaculate fish on the plate. Right. And that really starts at the boat. And how many of them come in here and eat? A couple. Okay. A couple here and there. Not as many as I'd like, you know? We like that. We like it when the, when the fishermen come in. We love it when the farmers come in. We show them where, where their babies go and they graduate. And we think of ourselves as like college for vegetables and fish. You're you, finishing school. Right, you raise them, you bring them here, <laughs> we send them out into the world the way they're supposed to be, yeah. right? So starting from top left, we have a little watermelon and chioga beet salad with a little Thai basil. To right of that, we have a little black sea bass crudo of a local, local whipping pin cherries uh, with a little bit of scallion on top. Below that, we have fried oysters with our famous chili and mint sauce. And to the left of that, grilled marinated quail, a little peach mustardo. When I surrender to Charlie, to the farm beyond, or to Terry's farm, who've already had to surrender to the season, to the variables of the weather, and we're having a, a relationship where we're both doing the best we can for each other, that's gonna translate to the plate. That's really good. That's ridiculous. What do the, what do the fishermen have to say about this? Have they seen this? I wouldn't know, I'll be in the kitchen. Now that is some beautiful crispy skin. We don't mess around with fish skin. There's no in between. It's either well, gonna be crispy or it's not. So what we have here is um, a deep respect for and a relationship with Terry's Farm and Charlie Southold Fish Market as well as Artie. I'm gonna tell you, I'm obsessed with skin. Like, I don't understand people who don't want to eat the skin. Nothing you know? hurts me more than watching the plate come back and it's completely skin. cleared except for a chip of skin on the side of the dish. And I, I, I weep for those people that. I'm like, you know, it's like, it didn't it's, try it's, it. it's like you literally got the steak and the fries together all on one, you know. Right. And you sent the plate back, you ate the steak, you never ate any fries. Right, exactly.
Remember this the next time you think about sending back that plate of crispy skin. Guys like Adam are watching. If only all fish should be so lucky to go from water to Adam's menu in a 12-hour span. We are here in our Melville location, in Nankin Melville and Hilton Hotel in Huntington. We are serving Indian, Chinese and Thai. Our Indian and Chinese is not traditional Indian Chinese, it's Asian fusion. It's a fresh boneless lobster, sauteed with ginger garlic, onion, scallion and the bamboo shoot with, with fresh crust pepper sauce. We are doing traditional Indian food here with all the barbecue, kebab, tandoori grill and biryani with all the curries, all Indian curries in our menu. We have again the same seasoning in our food which carries all that traditional and all that palette of and taste from the India to our people. It gives the same seasoning and same taste what we have in our back home in India. How do you pronounce this? Gyro. Gyro. Euro. Gyro. Gyro. How do you pronounce this? Gyro's cool, that's how it's spelt in, the, in English, in plain English. So I'm okay if you just come up and say gyro. If you go in the variation between, I think you should just say, if you're gonna say gyro, which is Greek, say gyro. If you're gonna just straight up American English, just say gyro. So here we make our gyro or gyro with pork, which is the traditional Greek gyro. So we make it very traditionally. We get the meat, it's never frozen. We have no freezers, no can openers, no microwaves. We butcher the meat. We marinate it, we stack it, and we, we cook it in the rotisserie. Gyro means to spin. Or, gy you know, the word gyrate, like, you know, you dance, you gyrate your hips, or something like that. It, it's really a word, you know, to gy yeah. gyro, spin. Gyro means to spin. Gyro means to spin. Right now we're going to put locally sourced oak wood into our smoker typically because it's what we can get the most of. All right, so typically we smoke our meat for about 14 to 15 hours. It really depends on each cut. Every cut's a little bit different, so we kind of go by feel. There's no set parameters. It's when the meat's ready, it's ready. So that's why briskets and barbecue in general is so tough because you can't go by a schedule. Typically we smoke everything overnight. And when we run out of food, it's because there's only so much space in the smoker. So typically down south, barbecue is an early breakfast lunch food, and by dinner, everything's sold out. Thanks for watching Feed Me. For more Great Island Eats, go to newsday.com slash feedme. And for more episodes of the show, watch us on your computer, Apple TV, Roku, or any mobile device when you download the Newsday app.